Let me start then with the lawyers. Because if we don't start with the lawyers, as I think Mike Rake indicated, we're very likely to end up with the lawyers. <laughs> uh, and it's as well to get them out of the road, uh, uh, out of the way to begin with. I think when one makes that point, I would also like to make the point that we've had a good deal of discussion this morning about transparency. And I think it's quite important that we recognise that transparency is not so much the vehicle to trust as the demand for cons transparency is an indication of the absence of trust. When you quiz your children about where they've been for the evening, it's not because you're confident that they've behaved well. <laughs> it's because you're not confident that they've behaved well. And if you are confident that they've behaved well, you probably don't bother to ask them for the information. The truth is, I believe we've gone too far down the transparency route in many ways. And as a result, have created annual reports that run to several hundred pages, most of which are of no interest to anyone to read and are not, in fact, read by anybody. Trust and transparency are not the same thing, and we should not regard transparency as a substitute for trust. But that's an incidental aspect of what we can learn, I think, from the lawyers. I would, I was going to say I would be rich, but I would not be rich. I would have enough at least for a decent meal if I had a pound for every person in business who has told me, of course, the purpose of business is to create money for shareholders. Or importantly, as said, well, the law says the purpose of business is to make money for shareholders. I think it's quite important to emphasize that the law doesn't say that the purpose of business is to make money for shareholders. In fact, which is helpful because it helps get the lawyers off the scene, the law doesn't say anything at all about the purpose of business. However, the law does say some relevant things about the duties of directors and the duty of a director in particular under British company law is to promote the success of the company for the benefit of the members. What is quite important there is to notice that it doesn't say the job of a director is to benefit the members. That quite important phrase, the success of the company, has been inserted in that particular formulation. And let us be clear, it was not inserted by accident in company law. It was inserted there with a deliberate design. The duty of a director of a company in Britain is to promote the success of the company. And it should be clear to anyone who thinks about it even for a moment that the success of a company is something that is essentially multidimensional. People have told me that uh, uh, that may rather curiously be true in, in Britain. It's not true in other countries. But it's certainly not true in the United States that the purpose of a company is to make money for its shareholders. Indeed, the, the totality of uh, these matters is a good deal vaguer in the United States than it is in Britain. And some of you may have been familiar by the recent, be familiar with the recent book by Lynn Stout, professor of law at Yale. It was somewhat surprising, if you read it as a British reader's conclusion, is that British law is actually far more shareholder friendly than United States law. And as a matter of fact, it is. It gives many more rights to shareholders than are available under US law, and particularly under the statutes and case law of Delaware, which is the state in which the majority of large US corporations are located. US law is not, in that sense, different from, uh, uh, from UK law. And this is an issue that varies across a different, uh, different countries, but there is actually no support for the legal proposition <coughs> that that is the obligation of directors of a company, or that that is legally defined as 
realize the purpose of business. <coughs> the second thing that the lawyers can help us with is that what is central to British company law and indeed American company law also is the doctrine of corporate personality. It says that the company is an entity independent of its members, independent of its managers, or anything else. That's something that was created in the, in the 19th century, that doctrine of corporate personality, and it's at the center of the way in which the law thinks about corporations. Having talked to the lawyers for a few minutes, let's move down the corridor and talk to the economists. One of the surprising things for people who don't know anything about economics, and it's a bit surprising even for people who do, is that economics doesn't spend very much time talking about firms. The standard economic models that people use don't actually have firms in them. They don't, as many, many more people now know, usually have money in them either. And a few people have thought that these are quite big deficiencies in, in <laughs> economic models. And I'm inclined to share their view. Uh, but economists haven't devoted much attention to the issue of what is a firm. But there are two broad theories of what a firm is. One is won the Nobel Prize for its architecture economist, as a matter of fact, called Ronald Coase. I wrote an, an autobiography, an obituary of him when he was 95. And the Financial Times, having noted he was 95, and thinking that it was pretty urgent of an obituary, actually that sat in their files for another seven years <laughs> before they had occasion to pull it out. But he did die last year at the ripe old age of 102. And Coase's theory was essentially that the boundaries of the firm were defined by the difference between markets and hierarchies. That there were some things that were done, best done by command and control, and some transactions that were best mediated through markets. And what determined the right size of a firm was deciding which transactions should be done on the command and control basis, and which should be done on the, the market basis. And that kind of theory is clearly relevant and important to a lot of decisions like what can a company outsource or what should it outsource and what can't it do on that. Second group of theories of the firm uh, came from a, another British economist called Edith Penrose in the 1960s. We don't give Nobel Prizes economics to women, I'm afraid, and, uh, uh, and she didn't actually get one for this. But Edith Penrose um, uh, defined the firm in terms of a group of capabilities. And what distinguishes a firm is the particular capabilities that that firm has differentially from other firms. Having picked up one or two pearls of wisdom, I hope you'll agree the economists, we might move down the corridor to the, the business strategists, the management people. <laughs> Those of you who know a little bit about business strategy will have been familiar with uh, the work of Michael Porter, one of these many books, um, Thomas Paketti's book on capital is, a, is another one, which appear to be rather more bought than read. Certainly in both cases, I have seen the books on many more shelves than the people I, I believe have read them. But Porter defined uh, the strategic challenges faced by a firm in terms of what he called the five forces, competition, substitution, dealing with suppliers, dealing with consumers, and facing new entrants. If you think of that list for a moment, you'll notice one thing about it, which is it doesn't do anything to explain why one firm is different from another firm in the same industry, because these firms face the same competitors, the same substitutes, the same suppliers, the same consumers, and the same potential entrants. The kind of way of thinking about business strategy that does 
draws on that Penrosian tradition and talks about the strategy of a firm in terms of defining the capabilities of a firm and understanding that the strategic advantage you might develop as a firm depends on identifying what is distinctive in terms of these capabilities. While we're talking to the business strategists, we might take a moment, they wouldn't be allowed inside the British Academy, I'm afraid, sorry John, to talk to business journalists. Uh, and uh, if we look at business journalists, we find once again two views of the firm. One they take in terms of what economists call a principal agent model, that is that the company is the creature of the shareholders and the managers and the people who work in the firm are there to create a, a shareholder volume. But the larger strand of business journalism today, particularly in the United States, is about business as centered around the heroic individual. Microsoft is the creation of Bill Gates, and everything that happened in Microsoft reflected the will of Bill Gates. That means that with Microsoft somewhat drifting today, what Microsoft should be searching for is a corporate savior of some kind. Similarly, whatever happens in, in General Electric, even though it's a company that employs several hundred thousand people, everything that happens there is the doing of Jack Welch or Jeff Immelt or whoever happens to be chief executive uh, of a company at the time. And portraits of companies are almost always centered around interviews with the chief executive that tell us the vision he has for the future of his company. I think you don't have to understand very much about business to realize that this is a travesty of how real businesses actually operate. So let's move on from the business journalists and talk to the anthropologists. Because what the anthropologists understand in ways that none of the people I've talked to already do is that most of what happens in business as everywhere else in our lives happens in small groups of people. And it's actually the relations between people in these small groups that determine the performance of the organization. And it's the interactions between these small groups that are what the structure of the business and the direction of the senior management should be intended to do. That's a very different take on business from the one generated by the cult of the heroic individual. Uh, a few years ago when I was teaching at London Business School, I brought along a retired chief executive to talk to the class. And at the end of the class, he said to me, you know, these kids regard being chief executive of a business as a prize rather than a responsibility. And I think in that particular phrase, he encapsulated more than almost anything I've heard what has gone wrong in the way we think about business over the last two or three decades. And finally, right, as, as we go along the corridor at the British Academy, we might talk to the philosophers. I mentioned there were linguistic philosophers. Uh, I don't find it helpful to talk to them about very much. <laughs> but in this particular context, we might notice that when we talk about business, we can talk about the purpose of business. We talk about the function of business. We talk about the role of business. We talk about the objectives of business. We talk about the goals of business. And we use these words almost interchangeably. People who think business is about profit use it in all these contexts. People who want to talk in wider terms uh, use that too. I think a philosopher would remind us that these are actually words that have different meanings. They exist in, they are different words in the English language because they have different connotations. And for example, uh, we in our individual lives have proximate goals but these are very different from our objectives or our purposes. 
and it's useful in thinking about business, I think, to distinguish you know, all of these. In particular, as an economist, I learnt when I started to study business that business didn't really maximise profits. And because it's the way economists think, I thought for a long time, so they don't maximise profits, what is it that they do maximise? And one day, the scales fell from my eyes and I realised that businesses don't actually maximise anything. They are complex organisations which respond to the interactions between people that actually give rise to them. Business is, in that sense, more complicated. So the linguistic philosophers can help us in that. And I think the moral philosophers can help us too in the ways about which we, uh, in this conference, a dialogue you know, a year ago, when we talked on the one hand about Catholic social teaching and its relevance to thinking about business in terms of not of maximizing, but of actually managing a balance between the whole range of characteristics that make a good business. In essentially the way that Aristotle talked two millennia ago about the characteristics that made you know, a good life, and in which Alistair McIntyre, most re more recently, has, has revived in what I certainly have found the most illuminating expression of, of this kind of way of thinking and the one that's reflected in Catholic social teaching. This is a world in which individuals, as well as individuals, don't go about maximizing anything. Success as an individual depends on maintaining a balance between a variety of different factors and characteristics, and that is true of business as well. And finally, we might talk to the political scientists who would be concerned about the social legitimacy of business and the way in which business fits into an overall political scene and about what the political responsibilities and obligations and the limits to these political responsibilities and obligations actually are. And we need, I think, to be quite careful about this in the way we think about it. Because I think the political role of business should be limited, severely limited actually, and in particular limited to aspects that relate specifically to the pursuit of business. That is, I don't think I can applaud Anita Roddick for being concerned as a businesswoman about the rainforest without accepting equally the legitimacy of, let us say, the Koch brothers in trying to restructure the US political system in a particular ideological style. I don't think I can say that the difference between one and the other is that I rather agree with the views that one is trying to express and disagree with the others. I think that neither of these actually have much to do with the proper purposes of business. The political role of business should actually be severely limited. And I think one of the great obstacles we have today, both to the social legitimacy of business and to the improved performance of business itself, is the way in which business and the financial sector is the worst offender in this, but can one can point to other industries like pharmaceuticals and media where we have the same problem, where we have an utterly inappropriate political involvement in the framing of public <coughs> policy towards these particular activities. So having talked to the lawyers, talked to the economists, talked to the business strategists, talked to the anthropologists, the philosophers, how do we put all this together? I think a helpful point to start is with that legal doctrine of corporate personality. And say this is not just, as some lawyers have been inclined to regard it, a legal fiction 
which says that the corporation can make contracts uh, and that the contracts in the modern economy are not just things between individuals. It actually goes further than that and corporate personality is actually real. Successful corporations in a modern economy are things that actually have the kind of personal characteristics that we attribute to individuals in our society as well. And that's a substantive observation and not just a legal fiction. That is, the, uh, the firm is not just what many economists have called a nexus of contracts in which people use it as a, uh, as a way to make agreements with each other and the firm is simply a group of people who find it convenient to come together every day and make much the same contracts with each other as they did yesterday. The successful firm is not and cannot be like that. A successful firm adds value in an economic sense only because it is more than the sum of these parts. And it's more than the sum of these parts and this takes us to the resource-based way of thinking about the nature of a corporation. It's more than the sum of these parts because the corporation has a set of distinctive capabilities, characteristics that in business terms generates its competitive advantage and which come out of the relations between individuals than the particular history that has formed that corporation in the way it, it, read, it read in the particular way it does. That we start putting all these things together and seeing that a firm is a construct that has purposes not in the sense of the economist of things which it maximizes, uh, but actually of having a balance of objectives and goals and different proximate goals which we, will, which we will pursue in the light of that. The firm has obligations to customers, to suppliers, to employees, to society as a whole, to the environment. And the job of the manager is not to maximize anything, but to kind of steer a course in which the business will inevitably drift towards paying too much attention to some of these objectives at the expense of others and must then be re, not refocused in some transformational way, but re-steered in order to ensure that it keeps that balance together looking forwards. That's the way we should be thinking about organizations from a legal point of view, from a business point of view, from an economic point of view, from an anthropology anthropological point of view. And it's also ultimately the way we need to be thinking about business from a moral and a political point of view as well. Because what we need to do is restore not just trust in business, which has been talked about already, but the legitimacy of business. If business is about maximizing shareholder value, then one asks the question, and people do ask the question, why should I allow organizations that, whose purpose is that to exist in modern society? And there is no good answer to that question. Or rather, the only good answer to that question is that businesses which have as one of their objectives the making of profits are valuable to society because of the services they deliver to consumers, to employees, and to society in general. And that is the only way in which business can actually justify its continuing existence. I've tried to give this morning a nuanced account drawn from a variety of different academic disciplines about how business should operate and what the role of business in society actually should be. I hope it's a very different account from the kind of crass description of business that says, of course, what business is about is making a profit. It is about making a profit, but business is uh, I b making a profit is no more than the, the purpose of business than breathing is the purpose of living.
Thank you all very much. So, uh, questions to John Kay. Uh, anybody want to um, get in before I do? Yeah, right at the very back there. <coughs> uh, Joe Confino at The Guardian. Um, I was just wondering how you think we can dispel that myth of business as being just for profit, because, I mean, that's so ingrained, and it, as you say, it's, it's trotted out continually by business people as that's what they're there for, and they're continuing to trot that out. So how do we actually start to really fundamentally change that within business that they actually recognize that difference? To be honest, I think that's a question you should have addressed to Mike Rake rather than, uh, than to me. Uh, I'm just the kind of lonely academic and occasional <laughs> journalist. I think that's a bit of escapist. <laughs> right? Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm personally doing, doing the best, best I can, can, which is to write uh, as much as I can about these issues and to talk to, to this kind of audience. I think it's only by these means uh, that we can do two things. First of all, educate business people to understand that this is not what the law is and that there is no law that says you are legally obliged to pay as little tax as possible. Uh, and I'm actually going to another meeting later in the, the, the day to have precisely that argument uh, with a group of, or, uh, of business people. And the second thing I think we can do is make people understand better, which is a result of the financial crisis in particular. I think there are the beginnings of an understanding that in the end, the constant repetition of that particular slogan, even if one believed it was true, undermines the legitimacy of business in a way, in a way that will, in the end, destroy the ability even to achieve these particular objectives. A question down here, um, a, a long way from Mike, so you could, you could, you could try to uh, get it out. Uh, uh, Thank you. Sakhi so Nusebi. Um, John, I want to start with the last point about politics, uh, and I'm biased because I actually think that business exists within a political system. I understand in a pure academic sense why uh, there should be a stronger demarcation. But the point that we've learned, I thought, from 2008 is that the effects that business decisions take and business leaders take have a profound impact on the whole of society. Uh, the, the results of the mistakes made by the financial system in 2008 are being borne by every single individual in this room for the next 30 years, by my children for the 30 years after that, because I don't think we can pay down the debt fast enough. And that, therefore, I think necessitates um, some kind of understanding that businesses have to exist within an understanding of not destroying the system they're in. And precisely because the political system had to bail them out, that gives legitimacy um, to some kind of political interference. I'll take it one step further. I'd say um, because business leaders, and I'm, I'm going to be even more controversial and heretical because I just like to be, because business leaders are involved in the use of resources and the allocation of capital to the use of resources, it is up to them to actually think about what happens if the earth warms another two degrees in 30 or 40 years' time. Okay, do you, you want to comment on that? Uh, I, I take the point you've made, but I, I take it in a rather different direction, which is to say that we learned in 2008 that the interdependencies in the financial system were so extensive that actually we, we, could not even, uh, we could not easily allow even what is a relatively unimportant organization like Lehman Brothers to fail without very large consequences for the, uh, the global economy. It seems to me the right lesson of that is not that we uh, write books of rules running to thousands of pages to regulate the future behavior of future Lehman Brothers. It is that we create a financial system that reduces these interdependencies to points at which we can allow businesses to fail without these kind of, these kind of 
consequences that, in my view, too big to fail is not something that either a, a dynamic economy or a properly functioning democracy can allow to continue to exist. And until we address that problem, our responses to the financial crisis will have been inadequate. Isn't a bank a firm? And if one looks at the banking sector and recognizes that the vast majority of transactions are between banks to make money, to make profit, um, you're more or less saying, actually, the whole structure of the financial sector is so geared towards profit that it's unrescuable. John, I'm just on the point of finishing a book on reform of the financial sector, <laughs> which I hope will answer the question. <laughs> but it's not coming out until next you year. It? It's not coming out until next year, but I don't think the issue will have gone away <laughs> by next year. <laughs> so I hope you'll all come back and we can talk about it a okay, year. Okay, there's a